After I initially agreed to present a talk um, in relation to a Buckinghamshire murder, a mild panic ensued as it suddenly dawned on me that we hold very few records relating to historic Buckinghamshire murders. In fact, I can probably count them all on one hand. However, while I was feverishly rifling through our collection in search of material to use for this talk, one item which, well, a couple of items which um, caught my eye were two 19th century broadsheets relating to the trial and execution of one John Torwell. Torwell had been charged and was subsequently convicted of murder. And this murder had taken place in Salt Hill near Slough in 1845. And what struck me about this case in particular was not the murder per se, but the conflicting character traits of the perpetrator. Granted, before his conviction, Torwell had led a rather colourful life. In fact, I think it would be fair to say that he had had a chequered past. He certainly didn't fit the profile of a murderer. To begin with, as far as we know, he had no previous uh, convictions or history of violence. He was a man of sound and stable mind. And by all accounts, he was a thoroughly likeable and popular character, both in his professional life and within the various communities in which he resided. So what was it that drove John Torwell to kill? I'm going to start off by very briefly setting the scene of the trial. I'll then go back and visit his early life, after which I'll explore just a few key events in his life. Um, including those which led to his trial and subsequent conviction. John Torwell was born in 1784 in Beckles, Norfolk. He was the son of a general storekeeper. Torwell's early childhood was pretty ordinary. After attending the local village school, he went into the service of a Quaker widow who owned a general store in Lowestoft, Suffolk. It was at this point that Torwell became obsessed with Quakerism, so much so that he began dressing in full traditional Quaker costume and worshipping at the various Society of Friends meeting houses. Torwell stayed with the widow for five years and in 1804 decided to move to the Big Smoke, where he very quickly found work at a large drapery store in Whitechapel. Torwell's new employer, his colleagues and the customers took an instant liking to him. He was able to ingratiate himself very quickly and soon became a very, an extremely well-respected member of staff and a popular character within the community. The Salt Hill murder trial of 1845 attracted tremendous public interest. It was the talk of the town and the great British public salivated over every salacious detail as it was plastered across the various tabloids of the day. This was a trial which had all the ingredients of a perfect scandal. It had sex, drugs and blackmail. This was the trial of the century. At 10 a.m. on Wednesday the 12th of March 1845, 61-year-old John Torwell found himself standing in the dock at Aylesbury Courthouse charged with the murder of one Sarah Hart. Now, what's interesting about this case? It was the first arrest that had ever been made using communication technology. However, it wasn't the first time that Torwell had fallen foul of the law. In 1814, he had been accused of attempting to defraud Smith's Bank of Uxbridge by trying to pass off a forged £10 note, a crime which back then carried the death penalty. However, fortunately for Torwell, the owners of the bank were Quakers, who were vehemently opposed to the death penalty and requested that his sentence be downgraded. This resulted in Torwell pleading guilty by arrangement and he was subsequently transported to Australia. In spite of Torwell's personable character, he was a deeply flawed individual with some quite odd conflicting character traits. 
And it seemed that whenever things were going well for Torwell, Torwell, for some reason, he would engage in behaviour which would upset or overturn the apple cart. It was almost as if he was trying to sabotage his own happiness and success. Not long after he'd been admitted into the Society of Friends, Torwell met and married a young lady by the name of Mary Freeman and they went on to have two children together. However, Torwell's union with Freeman had taken place under rather checkered circumstances. First of all, Freeman was the housemaid of Torwell's employer, Mr. Jansen, and secondly, she had fallen pregnant with Torwell's child. And in an attempt to reduce the fallout from the scandal, Mr. Marsden put intense pressure on Torwell to marry Mary, which Torwell did, albeit reluctantly. But as if this wasn't enough, Torwell was also corresponding with a Quaker lady in Yarmouth, whom he had become intimate with and whom he intended to marry. However, he was now saddled with his employer's housemaid, Mary, whom he had no feelings for whatsoever and whom he, could, and whom he consequently treated contemptuously and rather shabbily. Not long after his marriage to Mary, Torwell decided to leave the drapery store in search of pastures new. And after a brief stint of working for himself, he found work with the Mr. Marsden, who was head of a large wholesale drug and patent medicine store in Cheapside, London. Again, Torwell ingratiated himself very quickly. He proved himself to be hardworking, diligent and enthusiastic with a good head for business. His colleagues teased him and referred to him as the travelling Quaker as he proved himself to be an exemplary travelling salesman. While working at the drugstore, Torwell also acquired a considerable amount of medical knowledge. He learnt about various drugs and chemical compounds, their uses and their properties. And he also learnt how to create medicinal preparations. As I mentioned earlier, in 1814, Torwell was transported to Australia as a result of a forgery conviction. And after working on the coal ships for a while, he was transferred to a convict hospital in Sydney. Again, he was a popular, he very quickly became a popular member of staff. He was popular with his colleagues and with his superiors, as well as the convicts themselves. In 1820, Torwell was eventually awarded his ticket to return to England. However, he decided to stay on in Sydney, where he opened what was believed to be Sydney's very first pharmacy. Torwell's new business was a thriving concern, which made him extremely prosperous. He also had a good head for investments. He speculated in oil and bought shares in a whaling ship. He owned vast swathes of land and cattle, as well as a large number of properties within the colony. And it wasn't long before he was able to send for his wife Mary and their two sons. The Torwells decided to return to England in 1831 and on their arrival they settled in Southwark, London. Before Torwell's transportation to Australia, the Society of Friends decided to sever all links with him and his and his membership was unceremoniously revoked. On his return to England, Torwell went to great lengths to, have, to try and have his membership reinstated. He still dressed in full Quaker costume and decided to donate vast sums of money to various Quaker causes. He still dressed in full Quaker costume and began worshipping again at the various Society of Friends meeting houses. However, he was only permitted to worship outwardly. As far as the Society of Friends was concerned, although Torwell had turned his life around and paid his debt to society, he had made some grave errors of judgment. Not only had he earned himself 
forgery conviction, he had also married a non-Quaker lady whom he had impregnated before marriage. Although the Torwells lived comfortably, they still had their fair share of tragedy and misfortune. In 1833, their youngest son, William, died, while 1838 was to witness the death of their oldest son, John. And as if this wasn't enough, Mary fell ill the same year. Torwell decided to hire a young lady by the name of Sarah Hart to care for his ailing wife and to help out around the house. But unfortunately, Mary succumbed to her sickness. After Mary's death, John Torwell engaged in a romantic affair with Sarah Hart, although at this point it's still unclear as to whether or not she remained at the Torwell residence. However, the relationship resulted in Sarah falling pregnant with Torwell's child, at which point she was promptly ensconced to a cottage in Salt Hill, Slough. In spite of Torwell's ongoing relationship with Sarah, in 1841, he met and married a Quaker widow by the name of Mrs. Sarah Cutforth, although he continued to pay regular visits to his mistress, Sarah Hart, which inevitably resulted in her falling pregnant with his second child. Torwell moved to Berkhampstead to start married life with his new wife. And although the couple lived in great style and grand luxury, things weren't quite as they seemed, as Torwell was experiencing some serious financial difficulties, and even the meagre allowance he was paying his mistress, Sarah, didn't help the situation. And to compound matters, Sarah had threatened to take out a court order for more maintenance for her and the children. Naturally, Torwell was mortified, as legal actions such as this which have, would have shone a spotlight on his extramarital affair with his mistress and would not only wreck his marriage but would ruin any chances of reconciliation with the Society of Friends. Torwell didn't take kindly to being blackmailed so he decided to pay his mistress a visit and on New Year's Day in 1845 he turned up at Sarah's cottage. The couple spent time together chatting and generally chewing the fat. And at one point, Torwell sent Sarah out to buy some bottles of porter, an alcoholic drink similar to stout. Between the hours of six and seven o'clock that evening, Torwell, dressed in full Quaker costume, was observed leaving Sarah's cottage by a neighbor. Mary Ann Ashley, the neighbour in question, reported hearing a stifled scream from Sarah's cottage, followed by the sound of moaning, and quickly rushed around there to investigate. However, on her way to the cottage, she bumped into a rather flustered Torwell who appeared to be having difficulty opening Sarah's gate. After Ashley opened the gate for him, Torwell apparently barged past her without saying a word. On entering the cottage, Ashley found Sarah on the floor, groaning and gasping for breath, and she immediately called for the local surgeon. But unfortunately, Sarah died on his arrival. On entering the cottage independently, both Ashley and the surgeon had noticed two glasses standing on a table in the same room where Sarah had died. On closer inspection, one of the glasses was empty, while the other contained a small quantity of porter and what appeared to be water. Suspicion didn't immediately fall upon Torwell, as he was still generally held in high regard. However, it later transpired that Sarah Hart had somehow ingested prussic acid, a drug used for the treatment of varicose veins, which contained hydrogen cyanide. The alarm was promptly raised, however Torwell had managed to board a Paddington train from Slough train station. The electric telegraph operator 
at Slough Station was provided with details of Torwell's description, which he in turn transmitted to the telegraph operator at Paddington Station. At this time, the electric telegraph was still in its infancy and was struggling to take off. However, this was the first time that it had been used to secure the arrest of a criminal suspect. The Salt Hill murder case put the electric telegraph on the map. On his arrival at Paddington Station, Torwell's movements were closely monitored by an undercover policeman who had spotted him leaving the station and had proceeded to follow him around the various parts of the city. Torwell was eventually apprehended on the following day at Jerusalem Coffee House in Cornhill. When questioned about the poisoning of Sarah Hart, Torwell denied knowing anybody from the Slough area and vehemently protested his innocence, but to no avail as he was immediately taken into custody. Although there was no actual evidence of Torwell having prussic acid on his person, it came to light that on the morning of the murder, Torwell had visited a chemist where he had purchased two drams of Shields acid, explaining that he required it for external application. Torwell apparently returned to the chemist the following day and purchased an additional bottle of the same drug, explaining that he had somehow misplaced the previous one. It also transpired that in the previous September, Sarah Hart had mysteriously fallen gravely ill after drinking a glass of porter during one of Torwell's visits, although after her recovery, she blamed her illness on the porter. While in prison, Torwell was visited by his wife, Sarah, his stepdaughter and his brother. Mrs. Torwell only had words of comfort and affection for her beloved husband, whom she believed was totally innocent. Torwell was in complete denial and apparently had a carriage waiting to whisk him home at the end of the trial, which he believed would end with his acquittal. After a three-day trial at Aylesbury Courthouse, the jury foreman delivered a guilty verdict, after which the judge passed the death penalty. Torwell was apparently poker-faced to the end, showing very little emotion. Meanwhile, Aylesbury was bustling with hordes of visitors who had travelled from far and wide to attend the execution. The scaffold was duly erected on the balcony at the front of the old Aylesbury County Hall building. On Friday the 28th of March 1845, a visibly frail and trembling Torwell was led to the scaffold, his face half covered with a black nightcap. Torwell's executioner, the famous, or some might argue infamous, William Calcraft, was a hangman renowned for his short drops. However, on this occasion, it soon became clear that he had used far more rope than was required for a man of Torwell's slight build and stature. It's still unclear as to whether or not Calcraft simply miscalculated the drop, although at this point he already had 16 years of experience behind him and several successful executions under his belt. Needless to say, Torwell's execution was the stuff of nightmares. His arms flailed wildly in different directions while his torso convulsed violently for several grisly minutes. Torwell was effectively strangled to death. This would be the last execution that would take place in front of County Hall. Before his execution, Torwell allegedly had presented the jail chaplain, Reverend F. Cox, with a letter. Some say that the Reverend kept the details of the letter to himself, while other sources, including some of the tabloids of the day, maintained that in the letter, Torwell had, in fact, confessed to Hart's murder, as well as her attempted murder in the previous September. Unfortunately, the details of the letter have never been published. So whether or not Torwell actually confessed to Sarah Hart's murder, we will never know.